That's good. All right. So we had no sound there for a moment, and we're live, and we're working on it. I think you guys can hear us. Uh, we have Pando joining us from the initiative today, and uh, he's just joined us, so Boat is busy working on getting a nameplate up for him. And uh, yeah, it's good to be back. We had a couple weeks off due to eVegas. We're going to be talking a lot today about the various things we learned from eVegas and analyzing them. Uh, I think that Pando probably, I'm going to take a wild guess that Pando so, has some opinions about the proposed changes to Boosters, uh, and we're going to like let him uh, rant about that if he wants. Uh, and there's something I have to do that's very important at the start of the show, um, and I'm going to uh, actually wait until the camera gets clear so I can I can show this off. Uh, holy okay. fuck, actually, yeah, so holy fuck from Lon. Uh, the the guys in in lawn had really cool shirts this year at eVegas, Vegas, and I uh, I really wanted one, uh, and I'll show you it to you in a moment. And I said I was going to wear it on the Meta Show, and I had it on just a few minutes ago, and then I realized that nobody could actually see the fucking shirt or the cool bit about it, which is on the back. So I'm going to hold up this really cool shirt that the uh, the lawn guys gave me, uh, and it's uh, well I'll just show you, and you can take away from it what you will. Hang on. Oh, I got to see this. Making sure he doesn't get his pit stains on the on the camera. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah, it's a it's a an eat my ass or eat my grass uh, a shirt with a lawn gnome on it. So uh, you know the uh, the ass eating war memes continue. So I just thought that was really cool, and I was really happy. Like they didn't they didn't get a, the, this was a scenario. Like they didn't have like these shirts. They're like, hey, mittens have one. I was like, oh my god, if you could get me one of those shirts, please, because it's awesome. So yeah, uh, they were cool. And they, they got one. So thanks. To so yeah, while you guys are off join E Vegas, uh, I, I coach wrestling on the like like side now, and uh, while I was coaching, I sprained my LCL uh, last week. They got the uh, ortho to verify that. Then, after it was verified, messed up, I'm wearing a brace today. We had, like, a scrimmage. And I was coaching one of the guys. Because like, during the scrimmage, you kind of do a little bit of practicing. Then you go back and forth uh, against other teams. Uh, two light, lighter weight guys, sixth graders. They're probably, like, 100 pounds each. Literally did a move right into the fucking back of my knee. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like, the trainer came running out and saw that they did how, that. How old was the – like, was this a fourth grader? How old was the sixth child? Grader, that, sixth grader. That, Sixth grade. Okay, so book yeah, so, sixth grade. Yeah, so I have my knee brace on and everything, and they just went like right into the side that's injured, and I'm just like, oh, no, oh god, it was throbbing, it was painful. But then I, I, I have a picture to show on screen. Uh, then I got the news yesterday, like pretty late last night, uh, that I aced my, uh, my big test that I had to take. So there's the stats on screen. I wanted to share just, just how amazing I am at test taking. Uh, two hundred is a perfect score. Con congratulations on your yeah. middle school social studies test. It basically allows me to. Proud of you. It allows me to skip my master's degree and go straight to, like, certified teaching in like lots of different places. So yeah, really awesome. All right. Well, we're going to talk about some Eve Online shit here in a moment, and uh, I want to do some shout outs for people yes. that have been uh, subscribing. We normally I was busy showing off the shirt, so I didn't get a chance to do shout. So. Uh, Abadios, two toot, thank you very much. Fifteen months. Keys, two thousand. Uh, Twenty-two months. Very nice. Canum for Canum Ferrex, seven months. Joe Yavavich, Yavavich, I should say. Jaws Yavavich. It's hard to pronounce Twitch names sometimes, but I, I do try. We uh, try here. Bruce yes. Nero and uh, Sikander Cole. Yeah, actually, Sikander. Uh, hey, Sikander hey, was uh, initiative Diplo and hang out in. Uh, in Vegas and had a pretty cool suit. And <laughs> <laughs> uh, Noisy Gamer says when Bo talks about World War II, listen, 
because, because he's he certified. Is certified. What's funny is oh, I, I know the two questions I missed. One was on the Colombian Exchange, and the other one was on uh, the uh, who wrote the Republic. I think I put uh, I think I put Plato wrote the Republic. Yeah, I put I put Aristotle instead of Plato, and I noticed afterward. I like that. Yeah, fuck. All right, so um, while I eat a banana, let's talk about some fucking spaceship games. So overall, my impression of Vegas was uh, I'm really delighted that we have crunchy things to talk about. Are you, are you allowed to do that on, on, on camera, eat bananas on Twitch? I know they have certain guidelines. I, I, I don't know. I've maybe, got a maybe Hawaiian punch soda, so I mean. In some way. Uh, but, well, they have a banana yeah. for scales. Yeah, because it is. All right, so spaceships, motherfuckers. We're <laughs> trying. to talk about the spaceship game. Uh, so... <laughs> Basically, I, I just want to give people my overall impression of Vegas. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people in the community were kind of, uh, you know, the blackout stuff, the PCU going down. Everybody, everybody at Vegas was sort of looking around and wondering, what is CCB going to show us that we can be hopeful for, right? And, you know, I'm not a Pollyanna. I'm not going to tell you that, like, everything is fucking peachy. Uh, we have seen this kind of scenario in the history of the game before, uh, during the Incarna Crisis and in the aftermath of the Incarna Crisis. Uh, and the good news is not that everything is hunky dory, but I think that we are headed on a positive path because what I'm seeing now from CCP and what I saw in Vegas, uh, was, uh, sort of the post incarnate playbook, right? Um, seems like, uh, CCP burger and crew are working on the new player experience, uh, which is a good thing. Um, I know a lot of people like sort of poo pooed the whole, uh, CCP move, the number of people that were going through the tutorial or th certain steps through the funnel from like 22% to 30%. And they announced that at the keynote and people sort of like rolled their eyes, but actually making those numbers move that much is really hard to do. So we mm -hmm. want more players in the game. Uh, CCP is doing some good work there and they seem to have empowered rise and his team to do a bunch of tweaks, uh, many of which might be nerfs to people like us out of Nullsec or whatever, the boosher changes, shifts to jump bridges and stuff like that. But, um, you know, Rise has been around for a long time and the fact that they're empowering him to uh, do changes every couple weeks, I think is just a really positive thing. It seems like, you know, we're on the post Incarna uh, coming together and unfucking playbook. Uh, and, and I really kind of, I, I don't, I'm not gonna say everything's perfect, but I do think that we're sort of out of the imminent danger zone. And, you know, the numbers are going up in terms of people playing EVE Online. Uh, and they did have a, a bunch of actual changes to the game that they are talking about. So we're going to be going through some of those things today. But that is, like, my overall framework. I'm not going to say everything's fucking hunky-dory, but things are getting better. And that's, I think, all we fucking want at the end of the day is to be able to mash thousands of spaceships against thousands of spaceships. And uh, I saw a future where... Thousands of spaceships are going to go back to getting mashed against thousands of spaceships, and so that's good. So that's my sort of overall uh, Vegas report. Uh, but it, it, Jay, what you got? That's really good because, like in in the pre Vegas show we did, our main concern was um, that CCP wasn't going to solidify that they have a future with Eve Online with the community, and I think Vegas has. Um, there are still a lot of problems. Um, they didn't release a roadmap or whatever. And some people were really upset about them not releasing a roadmap. But I think, and Rise actually said this in the core gameplay update, is they don't want to commit to changes and then have their schedules change, which happens a lot because, you know, they're working on different things. They don't have as many developers as a big company. So that if they commit to changing, you know, this aspect of the game and then, you know, the priority shifts, the meta adjusts or whatever, and suddenly, oh, hey, uh, the Koreans are coming in, we need to overhaul the MPE and they get moved from doing Shield Slaves, for example, then, you know, they can do that and no one's getting disappointed in the end because they're, they're delivering something which is good to the game, not just, oh, sorry, we haven't got Shield Slaves ready yet. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to eat some crow on this because uh, before I went to Vegas, I was like saying, guys, give us a roadmap, give us a vision, give us something. Uh, and, you know, I'm not wedded to having a, a roadmap. What I wanted to see was who is an adult in the room that is working on some stuff that involves spaceships that are, you know, issues that are germane to the community. Uh, and I think it's a real problem. I was watching, I was watching, you know, I was high and watching YouTube videos at like three in the morning and I was watching a review of outer, uh, the outer wilds, outer worlds. I haven't bought it yet, but I'm interested, you know, the new uh, Obsidian game. Uh, and one of the things they were talking about is how Bethesda ran into a trap by publishing so many roadmaps that now 
gamers as a whole are just sort of skeptical of roadmaps. So what we saw in Rise's presentation at Vegas, uh, you know, was more here are the things that we are looking to do that are realistic possibilities of things that we could actually change in the game. Uh, but it's not a roadmap, it's not a vision, but it is some sort of, hey, there are people working on this that are doing stuff. And um, I've become convinced that it is now that I know a little bit more, uh, I, I agree that it is better to have a short to medium term description of things that might realistically happen as opposed to a long term vision of a roadmap that isn't synced up with like business realities or like, you know, stuff going higher. Like we don't in the Imperium, like we have this vast, like functionally multinational corporation over here with tens of thousands of people. We don't use roadmaps internally. Like we don't say, hey, guys, in six months, we're going to be doing this like, or, you know, you can't really plan out more than a few months ahead of time for most things. And so that's just the way the world works. Uh, but, you know, they, they showed us some fucking red meat and uh, I think it's reasonable. So everything I was saying before the meta show about, oh, oh my God, roadmap revision. Uh, I do think that they buy, I think by showing what they're doing and having Rise and Team Talos uh, or Talos, I don't know how you're supposed to pronounce it, working on um, every two weeks or so, having some sort of change to the game in a variety of eras is enough of a vision for me. Like, I'm cool with that. I think that's great. I think that's something we haven't had for a long time. Uh, and, you know, Rise is often, you know, even nerfs Nullsec. One of the big things we're talking about now is like ner Nullsec jump gates, you know, the Ancelex uh, gates getting nerfed. Um, and I'm happy with it. Like, I'm, I might not be happy about the jump bridge change itself, but like, I am cool for people getting nerfed as need be to get back to active management of the game from the, the developers uh, and uh, getting us into a place where the social fabric of EVE Online gets back to uh, you know thousands of players mashing thousands of spaceships into each other and a lot of shit blowing up. Um, so yeah, I mean, I actually came away uh, cautiously optimistic. It's a pleasant surprise. So I, I want to point out that uh, I don't think you are correct. They did have a roadmap. It was just a roadmap of a roadmap, and that was bet that was good enough for some of us. As we were doing the show last week, we were watching the keynote. Uh, yeah, the, the roadmap of a roadmap was at least something of a roadmap. So we got to say the word roadmap, and that was that was made me happy. Uh, the Team Talos thing was interesting. I was disappointed that they pushed back Shield Slaves yet again. I mean, it's only been 10 years since they promised me that. Uh, but... Overall, the changes, some of them are scary. And we're going to get to why in a, in a minute here. But some of them scare the shit out of me. Just the fact that they're even thinking about some of these changes is scary as hell. Uh, uh, so, uh, what I, I wanted to say about the, uh, the new player stuff, yes, it's great that they're cranking up the numbers and stuff. It's not. I think the, the biggest bit disappointed for me is probably not... You just There's had a some change they announced, but they say they said they're boosting their dev time towards um, new player experience. But all they did was just improving the new player experience they already had. It's not a complete new concept, uh, as far as I can tell. And I think um, I'm not sure if that's in the long run going to be. That's not going to be enough, I believe, to get the numbers where they should be. I mean, it's great, and I love that they work on new player experience, and obviously um, we need new, new players. And whenever I talk about that stuff also, I, I always say a lot of the issues we have in the game, we wouldn't even be talking about if we had like 10 times the numbers of players. Everyone would be just busy shooting each other anyway. Right, there'd be a lot more resource scarcity and stuff like that. So a lot of issues will be gone. So yes, it's all about player numbers. But I think uh, for some reason I'm the only guy <laughs> that's uh, disappointed by what came out of the new player experience kind of stuff. And I'm not saying the num like what they did and the, um, like what they did with the new player experience is wrong, but I would have just wished for like a, a, a whole new concept, something. Well, like, what, what is it that you're looking for, for the new player stuff? Are you saying that they should just do like a gut and remodel and do a completely new NPE? Like what's your specific what? So I actually suggested a like a, a completely new uh, approach. I think half a year ago or something was pretty much right after I got unbanned. Um, and I suggested that they should at least find a way to uh, show new players what PvP looks like. So they kind of have an idea what a fight actually looks like. 
player with player, and then connect players together. And uh, I suggested actually have that kind of instance for new players, uh, similar to a, um, what's it called, Abyssal PvP site, and then team them up together, like have 2v2 stuff. And I think there would already be enough for people to, you know, get a connection there. Obviously, it's more in detail. I'm not going to, you know, go through this whole thing. There's more to this. But oh. it's just one way, you know, it's a social game and it's a hardcore PvP game. And that's two I aspects actually have that some are good not news present in the PvP. And the yeah, no, I, I have some good news for you. So uh, I heard through the grapevine in a non-NDA way. Uh, I made sure this was not NDA uh, in a conversation that I had. Uh, and I think this is an important. <laughs> it, I think that this is a uh, important conversation, or excuse me, an important change. That um, essentially what they want to do is make it easier for players as part of the funnel. Uh, it's a big leap to get people to join a corporation in terms of like social things. So like back in the day, they would try to funnel people towards uh, NullSec entities like, you know, Brave Newbies or to Karma Fleet or to Pandemic Horde or, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. send them to a newbie organization. Um, but it's a big leap in terms of social interaction and just effort on the part of the new player uh, to directly go from the new player experience and join a corporation. And an innovation that I believe they're working on uh, that I think is a really cool sort of middle step, uh, and they don't have this right now, is to funnel new players into a, a new player fleet finder, basically to make it easy for, to basically send them into uh, fleets that are aimed for, you know, new players and enable people to interact with the community and stuff like that. Uh, and it makes sense from a psychological investment perspective that it is a lot easier to just you know, I mean, in so many video games, you are randomly grouped up with other players and you go play the game, right, with other players. And then maybe you make some friends there and you have some sort of engagement there. Uh, so the idea of having the NPE funnel uh, detonate in a uh, in a, an easy, like, fleet finder kind of thing, I thought, you know, it's one of those ideas when you hear it, uh, you hear the idea and you go, Jesus Christ, why didn't we think about that years ago? Right. It's just one of those ideas that is so sensible on its face that you're like, crap, why didn't we think about that a long time ago? So uh, that is something that I heard when I was in Vegas and uh, I've never heard that idea pitched before. And I think, it, you know, we'll see if it works. I mean, if it doesn't work, we'll know. But uh, I think it's a cool trick to try. Uh, that is a middle step between you're playing a tutorial solo and you haven't met anybody. How do you get people to bridge that gap between I'm playing EVE Online I'm sliding through the tutorial. Maybe the tutorial is better than it was before. And then how do you get these people meeting EVE players who can then show them the ropes and recruit them and stuff like that? And um, I think the funnel, funneling people to uh, a fleet finder and getting people in a fleet uh, it is just a great idea because then that actually has an incentive for all of the player groups in EVE Online, be they null sec, be they low sec, be they whatever, uh, to have representatives to run fun fleets for newbies to try to engage them through this thing. Um, so yeah, well, January Valentine is saying newbies on patrol. Eve Uni did that before and it was really successful. Jay, what you got? It's one of those things where most people that join Eve, they're seeing these big fights occur and they're thinking, I want a piece of that. And then they join up Eve and then the first six, 12 hours is just tutorials doing very boring missions. If you put them right in a fight straight away, then you know, they, they get a piece of that um, that big fight aspect of the game, which they, they joined for originally, which is which is nice. You know, you can have fun, uh, something like back in the old Syndicate days as a, a Goonfleet newbie in 2006. Uh, you know, group activities and meeting people are, are very important. And even if it's not PvP, even if it's just like, you know, we would have these mining ops where we'd sit around in you know, Syndicate and drink beer and we're mining crokite with our ospreys and those those were still some of the most fun ops i've had in eve because we're sitting around we're bonding with each other we're getting shot at by uh dudes from snig and tempests who are like you know sniping newbies and shit like that uh and yeah like lux eterna and his tempest back in 2006 um but yeah i mean i, I just really think that the fact that CCP has recognized something that I didn't recognize. I mean, my suggestion was, hey, let's just try to funnel newbies into corporations. And uh, I heard the good word that 
uh, they tried that, they thought about that, and the middle step is to just get people into a group of other players so they can make some friends and make some social ties. And uh, I, I thought, you know, that's actually quite nuanced and sensible. And uh, that's another thing that gave me something to be hopeful about. That's like a, a crunchy, sensible thing that we know works in other games. Yeah. yeah Rage finder, agree. somebody saying in chat. So yeah, Pando, hopefully that helps a little bit. So now you know that if you want to introduce newbies to experience, when this goes in, you can, we can have newbie fleets and show them PvP once we yeah, once totally. we get them. Yeah, if the if they I'm not sure if I even watched all of the if Vegas stuff. Obviously it's not my time zone and stuff. Um so I think I picked up most of the important stuff but if maybe they even said it on stage somewhere and there's more to the uh, new play experience and stuff um you know so i didn't i didn't want to you know shit on anything then so if they look into that and they're aware that it's pvp and uh, the social aspect that they should focus on to get players involved then yeah that's great I got to show the shirt again. Holy fuck, uh, just joined us. And uh, I think he missed the first part of the, the meta show where I was showing off the shirt. And uh, he's the dude that got me this thing. So I'm going to show it off again. Yeah, that's one thing about the Vega stuff. You watch it and I know uh, I get a little bit jelly. Uh, I would love to, to be there, even though I think maybe Vega. Vegas is not the thing for me, but... Um, Vegas uh, fucking sure. ends. It's a blast. Yeah, well, it's hard to tell from the outside. So I've never been on a big uh, EVE event. So. Well, yeah, I mean, so once it, you go for your first time, it's a whole coming up. world. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to be in London. Ooh. But London is not as big as Vegas or FanFest or just stuff, right? Do me a favor. Vegas, just Vegas is one, absolutely one day. Day. Because, I mean, you can get legal edibles. So, like, a lot of us were just, like, high as balls for, like, four days. Oh, yeah. Speaking of legal edibles, like, oh, my God. Almost died yes, on Friday. I'm taking uh, new medicine for my knee and forgot about it. <laughs> and then <laughs> had some very legal stuff. And, oh, my God, I almost died. It was... It was an amazing, amazing feeling. But anyway, moving forward. Uh, to you more took a sixth Vegas. grader to the knee. All right, so no, let's talk no, about some that, crunchy no, no. shit. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, Team Talos is now run by CCP Rise. They're going to focus on iterating the ships and game mechanics with the Eve. Their plan is to make a change in some of the aspects of the game about every two weeks. And they've teased the plans for the following. So here we go. In November, uh, Command Destroyers are getting whacked. Uh, while I don't agree uh, with this change, I think they should have done more, maybe nerfed it even harder. Uh uh, the micro jump field generator will only move 25 ships at maximum per activation, and it will choose randomly. For some reason, they say randomly, but knowing CCP, I bet you it jumps all the other boost ships first. I just have this feeling that they're going to mess well, I mean, this up. Essentially, if I understand this correctly, this is a nerf to the classic like initiative Snatch Fleet, which is like kind of Ravens like Pando's, and, yeah. one of Pando's things, right? Is to go in and boosh off. You find the hostile FC and you decapitate the, the fleet commander by booshing him away from his fleet and killing him. And then, yeah. uh, you know, it's, it's over at that. So, uh, you know, this, this is the kind of change that... Uh, you know, you can still boosh people, but you you don't know if you're going to be able to get the FC. And um, somebody's saying it's a nerf to Stuga fleets, possibly not to yeah, the Snatch fleets. So Pando, I mean, yeah, it sounds like, you know, people are saying in chat here, it's a Pando nerf. Uh, it's and I imagine you have strong yeah. opinions about it. What do we got, Jay? You were saying though? Uh, we almost have the, like, it's like we have the expert here on the topic. To talk about. Yeah, yeah, that's why yeah, I'm so, going So tell, us, tell us how this is going to, tell us how this is going to affect things, Pando. What do you think about it? What do you think they, uh, are they doing it right? Are they doing it wrong? What would you like to see instead? Like, you're the expert about all things bushing. So what's. Well, so I think like the last couple of days, I, I was just busy getting triggered about that nerf. Obviously, I'm not a big fan. It's. Uh, not only that it's done uh, is bad, but the way it's done is bad. Um, there's not going to be any bush fleets uh, anymore uh, after this. Right? Any bush fleets that are capable of taking on significant numbers of hostiles, at least. Uh, I know people always keep suggesting, oh, you can just split up in groups of 25. That's people who have never run any bush fleet of any sort that think it's just super easy and that's, you know, you just have to bush. I mean, yeah, that's you can. 
You can split up into a group of 25 if you had 10 pandos in a fleet, right? Well, yes, obviously. If you, like, and then also, I'm probably not good at coordinating even with another pando. Right? It's not that easy, even if if the, if the you think alike, and so it's, you're not going to pull it off. It's very hard. Yeah. Um, so I think CCP and most people that cry about bushing underestimate um, how hard it can be. And I'm, I'm very much aware that if you have a Stuka fleet on grid, uh, you always run, uh, there's always that risk that if you get caught, you get completely wiped out in the subcap fleet. Oh, yeah. But in general, in general, any popular subcap fleet doctrine at this point in a one on one situation, let's say 100 versus 100, will always have the advantage over Stugas. Always. There's so many ways you can deal with it. You can just spread out. You can bring your own bushes. And Torps are traveling so slow, you'll never have the kill speed to compete with any other subcap doctrine. So I'm not sure if they aimed it at Stugas. If they did, uh, if they did that's completely dumb. I think they probably did that also, uh, which I think is probably the more um, uh, problematic concept is like bush eagles, for example. They're very hard to catch and they're yeah. very, uh, you know, stable, I would say. So is, uh, bush eagles, I would, I would get that uh, idea that, you know, yes, it's very hard to deal with. But yeah, so if you're it wasn't for them, Stukas, oh, what sorry. are you going to do? Yeah, so it right, wasn't just for saying. Stukas. He said it very clearly. He called. He basically called you out, which is kind of uh, know, hilarious. Yeah. So what he said was, "Is we do not want another situation where a keep star dies to a bunch of ravens that can just jump around endlessly, avoiding the damage." So it looked it's like his so target, to, to right? Like his so target wasn't so much Stukas, but like yeah, that yeah. So why aren't there raven fleets uh, flying around everywhere? Kill, killing keep stars. Like, can you explain this to me? It's very fucking hard. Yeah. And even even the Hard Knocks guys, at least the FCs, I know the you know they're not the biggest fans of mine, so they'll, they'll never agree. But they sh will agree. It's not that easy, and you always run the risk if you're anchored and you're all your the, the the entire thing is all anchored on uh, on one point. If you get lopsided, if if something happens and throws you off. The, the whole thing that you know it just falls apart so quick so you have to be on point for an extended period of time to kill a keepster you need an entire fleet of ravens to even hit the damage cap right. it's like there's 250 battleships that are not super tanky you know, kind of thin they're all anchored on one spot just to pause the thing that's that doesn't mean you're winning a fight on top of it right you guys were in rage for example the final timer wasn't the real fight. Getting the second timer done was the actual fight. They didn't form, but hey, whatever. But if they would have formed and brought anything, the Ravens, like this 250-man fleet, that's completely out of the fight. We're just there to pause the thing. Everything else is just um, there to protect those Ravens. And these guys all fight. So you can call that a bad thing if you want, but there's more than enough time to win the fight and then kill the Ravens. If you lose the fight, you lose the thing. The only thing, like for example, H-5, which is also a time where you were there, the only reason why we could do that probably was because the Keepster was onlining and the FC was just not you know, that experienced with supers and titans and all that stuff. So we had like a ton of support ships there to just cover the Ravens. So whenever another hostile fleet warped onto us, we had one or two uh, friendly fleets warp in and cover us from these guys. Keep them busy at least, bubble them, make sure they can't follow us and all that stuff. I'm telling you right now, if you have only a Raven fleet, do anything, I'll derail that thing with like 50 dudes. Yeah. 100%. It's so, it's not that hard. And, um, you know, to just call that a massive problem. And I think I want to like say like i think main reason why this perception of ravens being too strong or whatever is around is that article from jintan that he wrote uh, a while ago and he talked about a massive wave of warmer evictions with bush ravens which is straight up just out of imagination there's one fortisar that died and then one keeps the recently in a, a c2 and everyone who watched that closely 
it wasn't the ravens killing it or it wasn't the bushing i think they didn't even bush the entire time they killed that thing they could have killed that with any other subcrypt doctrine with any other right. right so to make that claim to say that's a problem it's ridiculous and yeah, that's all time huh? there's a video of that this yeah, the i fleet think got derailed three times okay so i want to i want to get in here because hey, we uh like we got to draw a line under the boost stuff because we have more nerfs to talk about that are potentially controversial or not controversial that are going to have a big impact on the game. Uh, yeah, so, so we got uh, a lot of these to go through. Next is uh, uh, Boson, Boson Sig was increased from 2,000 to 10,000. This is not a huge change in the eyes of people I trust. Uh, I went around asking the experts of Bushing, like Mr. Fisker, uh, the sister Fisker, and he says very clearly that this just takes it from two to four Titans needed to really guarantee a wipe of a fleet, uh, especially a small subcap. So uh, he's not sure that this big SIG change really will matter in the long term because the way that SIG's always been kind of broken well, since Eve's It's founding. going to require, from what I understand, so moving the, the, the SIG on the Boson from 2,000 to 10,000 is uh, probably going to have a major impact on Boson riding for people that still do it. Yes, uh, yes. But it'll, it'll, it'll completely kill Boson yeah. riding. Yeah, there's no Boson and, riding. And, I'm, I'm, uh, so here's the thing. And I, and I say this from the perspective of somebody who now is in charge of the largest super capital fleet in the history of Eve Online, which is not a position I ever expected to find myself in. Uh, the position of Goon Swarm has always been death to all death super to caps. Super because, caps. yeah, like if they could just delete super caps, that'd be great. But at a bare minimum, uh, you know, even though we have all the super caps in the Imperium, I really don't like. You know, in my view, I've always been a subcapital guy. I believe that subcapitals are the foundation of gameplay and that subcapitals, just like how you have escorts of an aircraft carrier in the real world, uh, that subcapitals are there to escort and protect uh, capitals and super capitals. And that, uh, in my view, if CCP is going in a direction where it is harder for super capitals, uh, super carriers and titans to impact subcapitals as easily as they currently can, uh, I think that's a positive thing. I don't think that anybody, be they in the Imperium, be they Pandemic Legion or whatever, uh, should be able to do uh, a lot of what we used to see back in the battle days during and after the Great War, where you end up with people just plopping a bunch of Titans on a gate and there's no counterplay. They don't need to guard the Titans because the Titans can take care of themselves. Uh, I believe that uh, Titans need to be defended against subcapitals by subcapitals. So any nerf that's heading in a direction uh, where... You know, super caps fight super caps, and sub caps and caps fight around the big ships to guard them, just like you see in fucking Star Wars. Um, I think it's a positive thing, even if it's nerfing the Imperium super cap fleet, because I care more about the the ecosystem. So that's my view on it. I don't know yeah. if it's going to go far enough. Uh, maybe maybe we just you know put like double the number of titans to bosun instead it's probably not gonna make a difference in delve but it's at least a step yeah. in the right direction i think that's my view on it i don't know where, what do you guys where it'll matter where it'll matter is not so much the gate bushing it's going to be in fights you've seen test use bushing or not bushing wow bosoning sorry uh you've seen test use bosoning bosoning really effectively in fights in uh, big fights versus fraternity and others. Um, they actually trained their guys into using them. You saw them use them a lot against subcaps. This is where it's going to matter. Like, you get bubbled up in your battleship fleet. It might take a second or third tight to really kill you instead of just one really good placed one. Uh, so this this could make a big difference there when you're getting um, a boson. Uh, that's where I see it happening. But, Jay, you use the boson a lot, or at least have. What do you think? I have it in my past. Yeah, I don't really... Do it too much. Um, I, I, I like this change. I think that it was kind of shitty um, that you could just pocket a Titan on a gate or whatever and wait for a fleet to appear on these scan and instantly kill it. Um, even though I did it a couple times to like fraternity or whatever. Uh, you know, it, it's it, uh, it, it's also like so. It's it's a good change in the fact that. Um, uh, sorry, my, my mind just went blank. So it's a good change in that it, it reduces the amount of subcaps that will die, whatever. But it's also like a sad thing as well that it removes it from Titan Riding. Titan Riding is, is terrible and it's like way broken because you're very safe doing it. Um, and you know, you make a lot of money doing it basically to no, no, uh, no counter or whatever. But, um, what you did see was stupid people that have their first Titan 
in space with this massive, expensive, like, Ragnarok or whatever that doesn't have that much tank uh, ratting. And that was a play... You could you could make plays on that. And we lost quite a lot of uh, Titans in Delve because of that. And I don't think you're going to see as many Titan deaths in Delve now because of Boson ratting. And that's kind of sad um, that, 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 that you're, you're, you're seeing that go away. Uh, yeah, another thing, actually, Kendo, what do you got on this? Yeah, did someone actually run the numbers? Because I didn't run the numbers. Because, I mean, bosons at the moment, they have more than enough time, uh, damage to kill probably most subcaps twice. So even if they uh, double the signature, I'm not sure. Did they double it? It's from 2,000 to 10,000. So yeah, times four five. times. So, five, yeah. they could, so you need the, like, you apply only a quarter of the D, uh, DPS, but it's still going to be enough for certain ship types. And yeah. if you have two bosons, you still can delete an entire subcap fleet. So I would argue finding two people that hit a boson, uh, it's not that hard. And since you don't have any bushes anymore, because, you know, that's obviously super OP or something, um, how are you going to dodge that? Most doctrines are not going to be fast enough to dodge that. So everyone's going to stay in Mulan's kite and then warp off. Or they're not going to even show up to any Super Titans, whatever. So I don't think that's going to change a whole lot. I think it's great that they admit that the bosons uh, are in a bad place, but I always dislike a change that doesn't go far enough. It's same for the Dromies, because it always feels like a shut the fuck up kind of fix. You know, yeah. so here yeah. we are nerfing this. So now we've you know shut up for two years, and then we're going to come back maybe to this. And I think that's always bad. So do it right the first time, or just don't do it. That's my point on that. And that's the same for the dromies. Like the dromies are not the dromies alone are not the the issue. It's the reliable tackle dromies and sirens. So you can put a dromie and a siren on something, and it's tackled. They have to kill the siren before they can warp off. And that's the issue. If they would remove the sirens today, like I wouldn't even care about the bush uh, nerf. Like I, I wouldn't even give a shit. Because then I could bring any other subcap doctrine, and I know if I keep my range, I can still warp off. Worst case, we warp off. Right? But no, I get swarmed by fighters, boom. I'm going to lose like half my fleet to, to that kind of stuff. It's just, you know, it's like them admitting, yeah, there's a mistake, but uh, well, I mean, we're going to have to see. Like, the thing is about iterating. Like, I agree with you that CCP has had challenges in the past, uh, where by challenges, I mean it's a huge problem of tweaking one thing, promising that they're going to iterate on it, and then they forget that they promise they're going to iterate it and not do it. Uh, I will have to see what Rise delivers. Yeah. I mean, he has said publicly that they have empowered him to do like an every two weeks kind of change schedule. Uh, and if they just let the guy do what he wants and his team wants and stay the fuck out of the way uh, while they have the rest of them work on the new player experience, uh, we might actually get to see some of this every two weeks kind of stuff. And so I hope that they're able to deliver that. Uh, we're, you know, maybe the thing is, is that after like an Incarna style crisis, which is where we're in right now, where the post it's the post Incarna cleanup mode uh, where, you know, the danger to the community is sort of passed and everybody is sort of getting back together. Um, they have in the past empowered people like CCP Unifex, uh, John Lander, who's now Bethesda, uh, to make radical changes to the game and regularly update things. So, you know, usually once CCP realizes that they have done fucked up, uh, they then sort of get out of the way and actually start delivering things. So I hope that we'll see that. Part of that, though, is segue to the next one. Uh, sorry, I got to move us through this list because we've got. No, it's not, I'm going. I'm going to go to the next one because this yeah, is the like scary the, bit. Yeah. The, the this, next one this, uh, is this uh, jump gate nerf. Uh, what is it? Why don't you tell us about it? So it's not a jump gate nerf. The jump gates are staying the way they are. What it is is, is if you want to put up a jump gate after the patch, uh, you have to put at least 500 kilometers away from any citadel uh, for it to be functional. It's currently sits at 150K. Uh, this puts outside of citadel lock range, which is 490K, which is a big, big, big change. Uh, existing citadel... Uh, like Enzoplexes that are already down that won't get to, like, they're nice and safe will still work. No, they're not. They changed oh, that. they are? Yeah, they're they going to change that. that. Yeah. yeah. Okay, well, uh, well here's the thing. The patch, that... anything, Jay, anything. why don't you tell us what it is? So Go ahead. They, what they were going to do was grandfather in the old ones. So if you had a, a jump bridge 150 kilometers away from your keep star, it'd be fine. But they, they then backpedaled on that and said, actually, we're not going to grandfather them anymore. 
when the patch goes live, if it's within 500 kilometers, it won't work. So you need to unanchor it and then plop it back down at 500. This this feels like, and I'm 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 gonna say this, but there was a, a post by Right Rick uh, of a very small alliance where he mentions this. Uh, this feels like CCP looked at Keef Stars and go, okay, every every jump bridge is on a Keef Star. Keef Star has an instant doomsday, so you can't really camp a Keef Star grid jump bridge like you can the others, and it's just not going to work. We have to we have to move them further away from Keef Stars. But here here's the problem with this: Citadels are already pretty anemic. It's why CCP Rise felt he had to nerf uh, Boosh Ravens because Citadels couldn't do shit to them, uh, and this uh, Anzaplex change. Again, just points out the limitations of Keep Stars, Fortazars, and Citadels kind of defend themselves. Uh, and I don't like it. And the reason I say this is that you're basically making Keep Stars almost useless outside of it just looks big and bad because there's really no risk to go camp a Keep Stars jump bridge now. And the Keep Star could not even defend any of its things at that jump bridge, right? So you're going to see with this change if an alliance is. You know, only active for say six hours a day, but they have people who play in other time zones. That alliance as a whole is going to watch their space get chewed up all the time because you could just camp their jump bridges now and straight fuck them. I mean, well, I, so. I, I think that you know, there, there's a huge controversy involving this this jump bridge change and yeah. or the anchoring change where it is in space. You know, keeping them off keep start grids, etc. And a lot of the controversy has to do with the fact that when they announced the change, they said that people who already had them down didn't have to move them. And I didn't get emotionally invested in that as all because, like, you know, CCB has nerfed or buffed jump bridges off and on for ever since they were in, right? Like on CSM5, they were saying remove jump bridges completely. CSM6, Nullsec got involved and said, back off that, you know, and then we had them only one in each system. You used to have two in each system. So the the ebb and flow of nerf or buff jump bridges is something that has just happened throughout Eve's history. Um, I am not butt blasted about the change on the grandfathering. I thought it was kind of silly to say we're going to nerf yeah. jump bridges, but we're not going to nerf them for anybody who has them down because functionally all that means is that it's not really a nerf to jump bridges because you know, it, it wouldn't change anything in Imperium space, like unless they yeah. they force us to move them. Because what are you gonna do? Come like blow up a jump bridge in one DQ one against all of our Titans? So no, like if they're gonna nerf jump bridges, they have to nerf them for everybody. Uh, and unfortunately, because they promised to grandfather them, uh, and then everybody got mad about people who wanted them nerfed got mad about the grandfathering, and then they said, okay, never mind, we're just gonna have a grace period and we're not going to grandfather them. And then everybody who thought that they had dodged a bullet and didn't have to move their bridges is mad about that. So it's an unfortunate situation from like a PR and messaging strategy. But like, if jump bridges are gonna eat a nerf, they should need a ner eat a nerf for everybody and not just for the established empires that already have them. And I say that from the authority of somebody who has the biggest established empire. So like. You know, whatever. Like, we're going to eat a jump bridge nerf of some kind. Shit happens. It's not our first rodeo. That's my view on it. Oh, I think it's a great idea. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I think moving the jump bridge there is great. But again, we always say this on the show, and people always call us out and say, oh, they're just going to mention the look, guys. I'm sorry. If you're a small alliance that's time zone based and you have jump bridges, your jump bridges are just not going to work for, you know, 12 to 14 hours a day. And anyone that's trying to play the game outside of your time zone where you can safely protect that jump bridge, because now one guy can't just sit there and gun the key star, gun a Fortizar, and kind of guard the jump bridge a little bit. Now they can't guard it all, period. Uh, like, it's just not going to matter. What? But you're talking like small alliances are getting camped uh, by Kroki campers. Uh, that's that's not happening, though, is it? Well, it, it, they are. Well, here's like, the thing they are. Delve gets camped. Like, one DQ one's camped by like 20 to 30 guys. Pretty much daily in bombers and recons and stuff. Right, with this that's change, not a small group, though. No, no, <laughs> Dell's not. No, no, that's why I'm pointing out. Like we struggle to deal with this small group of twenty or thirty guys. Yeah, but small groups Imagine don't have that same problem. Vastly small. You don't think advantage. so? Yeah. No, I don't think so. I mean, we don't have that problem. We're not that small, so we have cloaky campers from like uh, low sec guys and all that stuff. But in general, it's not like uh, I would guess they got to camp all our jump bridges suddenly. 
one day to the other. And then also yeah. there's still this thing called scout. You can jump through a jump yeah. bridge with a scout and then say, hey, it's clear, let's go. Yeah, so, I mean, last time I checked, I nobody this... like ever is supposed to jump through a bridge without a scout. I mean, maybe I'm old school like that, but if you're jumping through a oh, bridge no. unscouted, like I would say, we're guys, we're going to be going into cool kills mode yeah. here uh, in a moment. So it'll be subs only. So people who have subscribed to the channel as sort of a thank you to you dudes, you can like ask us questions and we will take questions from the audience. Um, yeah, so we're going to go into cool kids so, mode. Yeah, let, me, uh, let me clarify that. I don't mean like you don't jump through a jump bridge without scouting it. What I'm more saying is is like in the situations where uh, like you're in a keep star in your home system and you can visibly see 15, 20 guys camping that jump bridge, uncloaked, you know, bubbles up and stuff. That's I've done that pre lock range nerfs. You know, like we're going to get where you can't even like Doomsday, the Keepstar grid, uh, to like the the grid where the Antiplex is going to sit. So this is going to be amazing for guys that like to camp gates or jump. Yeah, it's going to be amazing, exactly oh, it, for some yeah. guys. But I feel so bad for the people getting camped that really don't have the ability to push you off it. I don't know. I, I, like, I, mean, I, 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 I got to disagree with Mode on this one. Like, I think that That's you know, inter I think that interdicting jump bridges is a part of strategic harassment and grinding down alliances and putting them in the first stages of failure cascade. Like, it's a it's a kind of like guerrilla warfare kind of thing. Like, fucking with people on jump bridges is such a classic part of Eve Online that I mean, remember like ninking on beacons and on bridges and stuff where you like drop a dread and kill a jump freighter that either yep, yep. You know, usually use a beacon instead of a, a bridge. But you know, messing with transportation networks is like a thing in guerrilla warfare in Eve. And the fact that, you know, I, you know, one of the interesting things about Vegas for me is that I think that people outside of the Imperium uh, you know, people inside the Imperium know how twitchy I get on firesides and stuff when there's peace. Like, I play this game for thousands of people murdering each other in an internet spaceship game. Like, I'm all about the war and the murder and the conflict. And one of the things that really blew my mind, you know, I'm, I'm a fucking great war vet. Everybody, like, I've met a couple guys who are, like, with us in the Syndicate days in, uh, in Vegas this year is pretty badass. Uh, but, you know, old school players, like... I have a much more harsh view of EVE Online than I think the newer players who are outside the Imperium think. Like, I, you know, I don't care about asset safety. I think asset safety, asset safety is like new to me, right? Citadels are new. I think Citadels are too tough. I think we need a kiting mechanic so people can't like time zone tank if they don't actually live in a certain thing. There are a lot of things that we are doing in the Imperium in Delve that have made Delve into Fortress Delve. We're doing it because it's a competitive game and it takes advantage of the game mechanics that if you don't do that, you'll lose. But like I, I talked to a bunch of people that were surprised that I'm like, I don't like asset safety. I think, you know, you need to be able to defend your transportation network. So like, I don't give a shit about the jump bridge change. I think the fact that you could cover a jump bridge with a keep start is just incredibly stupid in the first place. The, there always must be risk because if there is no risk, there is no struggle. And if there is no struggle, there is no tribe, right? And, you know, it's just not fun if it's safe. Safety sucks. Peace sucks. War is why. War is a force that gives us meaning. Uh, okay. So, yeah, that was one of the recurring themes in talking to, to people at Vegas was like, no, I don't I don't like peace and security. You know, I, I don't like asset safety. You know, I miss fighting over R64s. I miss the conflict drivers. Fuck Fozzy Sov. I don't give a shit about the Citadels the way that they are currently. So, yeah, like my attitude towards the Jumpers thing, a lot of people are like ass blasted about it, but I'm like, if you have a super highway, you need to guard the thing and you shouldn't just have complete safety. This um, idea of having a a bridge guarded by a Keepstar is so new in the history of EVE Online and it is so dumb that I just don't even. So yeah, that's my stance on it. Yeah. Like uh, I'm an old school, hard, hardcore, like blood and murder dude. So whatever. I have that's some great news. Just say, news. Hold I couldn't on. agree more. I, I don't mean to interrupt, but I might have some breaking news here that could not hold if you go to the developer of ccp games website ccp falcon is no longer listed as a game developer i don't know if this is something from vegas or what but he is not on the list as a current game developer out of the 141 members listed they, is he it just a community dev no but i mean no he's one of that like he's one of the oldest developers at the company like his name's always been on that yeah. list i'm not gonna so, i'm not gonna comment on, uh, yeah, sorry, on that yeah so yeah uh, that's, so, God, you know, sorry, it, sorry, sorry. So we're talking about 
comically known for keeping their websites up to date. Yeah, like CCB's so. websites don't mean anything. I don't want. I saw some speculation. People were asking yeah. like, "Where's Falcon?" Where people have seen him earlier, but like, I don't want to talk about that on the show, and especially just because he's not on the website doesn't mean anything. I uh, yeah, as January Valentine, January Valentine just points out here that Logi Bro is still listed, and that's how old it is. So okay, okay, never mind. Okay, uh, we were talking about not- we were talking about jump bridges and stuff like that, and Panda was about to say something. Yeah. Yes, so, I just wanted to drop in. Since we're talking about developers and stuff, I think CCP Rise um, is still the best dev they have at this point. And even though I disagree with a couple of things he said uh, on the on that speed figures thing, I just want to you know let that be known. Like I still think that guy has um, the most potential of getting the right fixes out, and uh, he. Uh, he wants to, like, he is passionate about the game and wants to improve it. And it's the most important part. Because, I mean, I kind of feel like uh, I should say that just because I'm, you know, obviously disappointed about the whole Vegas kind of stuff. Well, I mean, yeah, like, we can argue about, like, booshing and things like that. But, like, you know, I'm never, I'm never, like, a big, you know, I hammer on CCP's C suite all the time. Like, it, I, we've had to do this song and dance routine during the Incarna Crisis and after. And you, you see this dynamic where, like, the line developers are people that really care about the game. They understand the game, like, they're doing whatever. And then periodically, like, the C suite gets control and they start trying to micromanage. And then you see Greed is good and a thousand dollar designer jeans and then $70 monocles. And then next thing you know, you're flying to Iceland five times in one year for emergency summits and a whole bunch of other dumb bullshit. Uh, so, you know, everything that's old is new is, is new again. So I'm never going to go out of my way to say nice things about, uh, you know, the the management of CCP when they start fucking with the game in areas that they don't understand. But uh, the, the line developers and, like, guys like Rise, like, you know, in, in many cases, in order for them to be them and their teams, like, it's just like, for God's sake, stop trying to micromanage from the top and let the devs who know how the game fucking works do their fucking job to fix the game. And, you know, I am, you know, on this roster of things that we were talking about, it's nerf, nerf, nerf. It's nerf to bosons, which are overpowered. It's nerfs to jump gates, which having jump gates guarded by keep stars is so dumb. Uh, you know, these the boosters, these are all things that are going to be seen as nerfs to the Imperium. And I think that they are all good for the health of the game. Like the things, and, and you know, I respect Rice. Like if he is going to say, and it's not like, I mean, he and I aren't like, you know, best friends or anything, but he knows how the game works. He can see when things things are overpowered and we have to eat a few nerves about it to get things back into a place where, you know, thousands of people can mash thousands of spaceships into each other. Uh, I'm all for it. Okay, so we need to move on, but I need to add one more thing. Uh, The comment, like what Pando said, how they don't go far enough with some of these changes. They moved the jump bridges out of the safety of the, 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 the range, but they didn't move the beacons. So you could still kind of protect the Sino beacon uh, if people are crazy enough to use Wait, it. Wait, what? It's not. That's it's just not a wording be, thing. They said in the in it the will tweet, be both. Ansi blocks, and I think it's just Ansi wording block structures. Are yeah, but oh, technically, okay, so that's just Sino okay, beacons okay. aren't called Ansi blocks; they're called Tenor blocks. So it, maybe it's just a wording thing. I don't know. We'll find out. Yeah, we'll find we'll out. Figure it out. It, yeah, uh, we got to move forward because uh, I've been the producer is pushing us here. Uh, there's a new bomb type they're toying with. And I think this is the dumbest thing to come out of CCP's brains in 15 years. And I love Fozzie Soft, so you all might not agree with me on this. Uh, it's a 300,000 damage bomb, uh, but only ships with heavy signatures will be hit by it. Uh, it takes 30 seconds to get there, which is a long time in the game, but not long enough to kill a Titan. Uh, look at the ship types. They uh, put them on. Uh, the obvious choice, however, for bombers is already got a lot going for them. Looks like they're not going to use bombers. Uh, maybe the T2 attack battle cruisers were suggested with a heavy bomb launcher. Something that could be killed or destroyed. But even then, I'm sorry, this has got to be one of the worst ideas out of CCP's mind in a long time. Because this will completely kill Why? I mean, I think it sounds cool. It's, yeah, exactly. It's interesting. It's, I mean, something it's neat. Like heavy bombers. Like you see that in fucking, uh, you know, what, like, you know, a, a Thai bomber? You know, th- this oh, is like a classic part of... Uh, like, a, a classic part of... Uh, video game and science fiction fleet combat tropes is you know you have your normal bombers that go after the smaller ships but then you have like the really big ones that are like super slow and hard to defend that are aimed at taking out capital ships and super capital ships and i, mean, I don't know if it'll work but 
you know, I think, you know, it's a totally new role that you could build fleet designs around. And uh, yeah, yeah. I mean, <laughs> let me let me go into like, so did they say what what exactly is the travel speed, though? Did they say it's the same range It's 30 km it, it, and they're just super 30, slow? Super slow 30 km. Yeah. So it takes 30 seconds so to get there. Think about slow it, though. So now think about it. You have a cap. Let's say you have a fax and it has one smart bomb fitted. You know the speed of that bomb is going to be so slow that you're going to have several chances of killing every single bomb with just one smart bomb. Right. right? Depends on, obviously, the hit points of this bomb. I'm not entirely sure what the hit points are. But you're going to cycle your smart bomb. Most of these bombs will never reach the target, probably. So yeah. you can firewall especially, them. So especially in, in large groups of Titans, right, Panda? Because we just got a oh, free high yeah. in Titans, basically. And every Titan in the Imperium has a smart bomb. I'll tell exactly. you that quickly. Where I so, see this... What, oh, sorry. Yeah, what? Where, where I'm seeing the scariness of this is not in a situation where you have caps and numbers. Where I'm seeing this is scary is you've... Uh, I take my Titan, I boast on the gate. Okay? I hit the enemy fleet, uh, enough survive. They light a Sino, in comes a hundred of these heavy bombers, and if they stagger them well enough, my Titan's going to eat a shit ton of damage very quickly before help could probably survive. Even if I could smart bomb a few of the bombs, there's no guarantee I get all of them, and my Titan could very well die, because 30 seconds good. is a, not long enough. Sure. I mean, I, like, good. I know what you're saying, I mean, but I like... You know, Titans should not... Titans like should be afraid of subcapitals. Back in the day, during the Great War and after, part of like the gospel of EVE Online, before we had way too many Titans and supercapitals everywhere, was that there is... Uh, Titans and supercarriers must have subcapital support, so you have to win the subcapital combat such that every newbie mattered, right? Because every newbie was yeah. enabling, the subcapitals were enabling and guarding the supercapitals to do their thing, and if you had a Titan or supercarrier that got caught alone without support, it was fucking dead. And that was just the thing. Like, if you had a Titan or a supercarrier, you had to have organization and you had an escort fleet and you needed cover. This whole idea of, like, Titans with Haas hanging out on a gate, blapping after burning rifters, is like why we killed Raiden Dot after the end of the Great War. Was they were doing that with Titans and they were blapping our newbies and after burning rifters. So, like, if people in supercarriers and Titans have to be worried because uh, bosons don't work as well anymore and there are these heavy bombers running around, you know, I agree with Jay that with an overlapping, well-organized strategic fleet using smart bombs and escort fleets, you're not really going to have to worry about this. But if you are sloppy and somebody has like a gank group based around new heavy bombers or something uh, and your ass gets torpedoed, like I, I, I would really like to see the balance of power. And again, speaking as the person who has the single strongest super capital force that has ever been assembled in the history of EVE Online, I would really like to see the the dial swing in the other direction towards subcapitals again. I think it has gone way too far in favor of see, just a pile of Titans means you win. And I think that Titan and super carrier pilots should be afraid of operating alone and should be punished for it when well, they do operate alone and are stupid. Oh, here's, a coming, okay, here's, here's a counterpoint to that, Jay, what you got? Here's a counterpoint to that. Is that with the abundance of people living in C2 wormholes that are actively rolling their Nullsec trains constantly, you could have a group like Inner Hell come out of a wormhole with 50, 60 bombers, Alpha, a Titan, or whatever, and then go back in the wormhole before anyone can respond. There's no counterplay to that. Yes, the Titan should be out there in the first place, unsupported itself, but that's the issue I see with them currently, is that you're going to have these groups living in C2 wormholes coming out bombing someone or bombing a carrier or like a couple of dreads, you know, hitting uh, whatever dreads hit nowadays. And then, you know, going back in without anyone being able to react quickly because yeah, um, you're going to have less than 20 seconds to get a fleet up and insist them. It just isn't really. Yeah. Like, I think it should be on a heavier hull. Like I, I think that yeah. the, the heavy that's bombs why, should not be on I a stealth bomber hull, like on a battle cruiser or something like that. Yeah. I think that would be like, you know, they need to be big, slow targets. So then you have to guard your attack bombers, right? You've got the heavy bombers and then you need to have smaller subcaps to guard and defend the heavy bombers as they're making the run. I don't think that you should be able to fit a, uh, 
you know, these big ass anti-capital bombs, there's no universe that they should fit on a stealth bomber because a stealth bomber is just yeah. not big enough to put a weapon on it that is stealth, big enough to already have so many uses currently anyway as it is, right? Like you can do pretty much everything in the game with stealth Yeah, I, I don't think it should be on a stealth bomber. Yeah. I didn't even consider Here's that would be on a stealth bomber. I thought they would make a new heavy bomber or something like that. It would be really dumb to put a line of fucking I already stealth like bomber, putting them like on the big heavy attack no. battle cruises, no, like see. the Naga or whatever, having a T2 that would be cool. I wanted to step further. Now, take it a step further. Because bombers bombers have that cloak, and they use cloak. Uh, Black Ops battleships with these would make sense to me, right? It would probably be too expensive bomb, to lose, because these things but, but are going to get vaporized. Is, and but these Black are Ops huge. Theater. Like, during big, huge fights, you're not really going to... I mean, because defender missiles are going to stop these, you know, things like that. Where I see these being big is, like Jay said, you're coming out of wormhole... So you you want to put some risk if you're gonna do this much damage, this quickly, potentially it needs to come with something that's risky. Battle cruisers, like the T two battle attack battle cruisers, it's a hundred million esque. That's not enough to really justify uh, putting out so much damage. But we gotta I, move I, forward. I, th I think that I think that Titans being alone is something that should be able to be punished. Yeah. Like I, I think know, that it doesn't have to be. I think that Black Ops I, BS I say, would be too well, expensive. I, Something I think in the Titans. 250 to 300 million range for a fitted out hull with like an attack uh, with a heavy bomb on it. I, well, guys, we're just speculating wildly. I think all we yeah, really know. know is that they're tied with this new bomb type. But like, I really think like a heavy ship that is somewhat expensive, uh, more expensive than a stealth bomber, but bigger and heavier and needs to be used in a sensible way. Uh, would you should be have, you should have fitting, fitting restrictions. Bomb. If you fit yeah, a heavy bomb, you should have fitting restrictions, like it might be inertia, uh, debuffs, or whatever, so you can't align as, as quickly. Oh, so, yeah. You're also, you're Dara says in the chat, dude, just strap a big ass fucking missile underneath the Drake. The Drake already looks like oh it's designed God, to just be, be straddling a fucking massive awesome. anti capital ship torpedo. <laughs> and that would be badass as hell. That would bring like, back the Drake. Please Why? bring my fucking Drake. Ryze did, say, did say that the Nighthawk is useless currently, so. Yeah, those, so those, that would be legit. Be that would be yeah, legit. Yeah. yeah, like a T two battle cruisers strap a big ass fucking nuclear missile See, under those here's suckers. My, and, uh... my view of this, I, instead of having a bomb that does insane amounts of damage, it's a one off thing, and you have to hope you get lucky. I I'll personally say it like this: I think there should be a sub capital ship that that has guns that can't track for shit, which means they're only going to hit carriers, dreads, you know, titans. But can do three or four thousand DPS and actually have the damage of a dread, but the you know HP of a, a battle cruiser or a cruiser, right? They they could do an ass load of damage against caps, but they're fragile. I think and that's where I, I know I do. Uh, but we got to move forward here because again, I, I just think that would be better than bombs. I don't I, I, look. This is coming from a guy that spent his career I like the bomb thing. I like obliterating the people with bombs, and I, I just, just want to drop in. I, yeah. I just want. There's another problem with those bombs. If uh -huh. your cap is moving with any kind of speed, they only have a radius, radius of a thousand. Hitting the oh, target yeah, yeah, yeah. might seem easy right now, but as soon as people realize there's a problem, they're going to move. Travel time. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Where I, where 30 I seconds. see this... If you, if you move by 200 meters per second, there you go. If right, time, gets, off, the time gets bombed by a regular bomb in that and the bubble goes down, time will pop in 30 seconds. But here, here's where I see this being a big deal, and someone agreed with me. We, were, we had a panel of this last week. And we got to move on. I'm so sorry, but we're going to go over today because I want to bring this up. The thing that makes this scary is not Titans. I mean, I say it from a Titan because I use my Titan like Mittens just said. I park it on a gate and go, I dare you to come at me, brah. And people don't. And I waste three hours of my life. But where this is going to be huge is Rorquals. Because panic requires you to be looking at your client paid attention. A lot of people are going to this style of... Let's make Rorquals as cheaply fit as possible, use T2 drones, and just have three or four of them to make up the difference, and AFK mine. If you're AFK for longer than 30 seconds, you don't get panic in time, and you're dead, right? And especially if this goes on a ship that can warp cloaked, I don't think CCP's going to do that. I'm not that. a fan of people doing anything AFK. In the right, right, me either. So, but like, I'm just if you, saying if you this step is gonna be away from your ship and you get ambushed by a bunch of heavy attack bombers and but you don't have time, time to timer. hit panic because you were... We're still talking it's about like, bombers, right? Right, right, right. right. But this you, is the thing about this is the thing about the Rorqual, like a dread. Okay? As you know, you mentioned this on the fireside. Yeah, you, I'm, I'm going to blow everybody's mind here. 
I think panic modules are stupid, and I still have no oh, idea why they okay. added them to the game. Uh, so, oh, like, I, you know, I, whatever. They added Seven it. minutes, five minutes of un- invulnerability for roll calls. Like, we use the hell out of it in Delve. Like, don't yeah. get me wrong. We fucking love roll calls. We love the panic modules. But, like, it, it's kind of like I, asset safety. It's just like, I don't, right, you know, I, I'm, I not, I'm not a fan. To disagree, We're going to no. use it, but I don't really I give a shit about panic. I think panic is needed. But here, here's the, th- the reason what, I bring uh, up the five. Why would you disagree, Panda? Well, so, if a roll call gets tackled... The defenders need to have at least a certain amount of time to form and do something about it. Like, it's not realistic to uh, ask people to have a constant uh, standing fleet up. It might be okay for big groups like us to, you know, do exactly that. But in general, that's not. You can't even ask people to, you know, stick around like twenty four seven and do this. That's like right. ridiculous. Having, so you having need, a group of, that's also why yeah. I think, like damage cap on citadels. You need to the, the FC needs to know. Okay, I've got so and so much time. I can form for five minutes and then get there in five minutes, and then I can fight for ten minutes on a citadel, for example. And then you know you can form. But then if it's no damage cap and there's like jets on your citadel, for example, it's probably over in five minutes. So like, why even form? You're not gonna get there in, in right. time and get them all pinned and all that stuff. So that's one of the big problems that pauses over that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mittens will agree with this. Remember if you pre fozzy solve where you would drop the SBUs and you had three, you had to babysit them for three hours. It gave the defenders an opportunity to form. And that's why I like panic modules. Not so much asset safety, because I agree with you. Asset safety is stupid and dumb. I mean, other capital ships that are caught out ratting don't have panic modules. But see, those capital ships are offensive capital ship. They're different. Um, I brought up the panic thing. Sorry, yeah, I'm okay. just trying to make it. I'm just trying to make it very clear that like my attitudes about which direction. Like again, one of the things that came away from me Vegas talking to a lot of people who are not in the Imperium is that people think that I'm like big into safety and all of these things that I actually think are stupid and don't give a shit about because all I care about is war and murder and spaceships blowing up, blowing up, and people mentality. screaming at them. The mentality of all these, like, I'm not going to call them new players because they're not new anymore. They're like four or five years old. But it's the mentality of these players that they weren't there before these these uh, these most recent camp changes uh, from like 2014. Yeah. They don't know that, you know, Supers and Titans are basically useless on their own before. And they're very used to fighters doing tons of DPS and having perfect application. They're used to panic roll calls. And they being able to dock roll. super caps in the yeah, first place yeah, is yeah, still like, weird like, to me. Like like half, yeah. the, half the Titans in GSF, they don't have dedicated alts for them because yeah. it's, it's just something they've never had before. You haven't, like like before before the patch or whatever, <laughs> when they updated Titans, you logged in your Titan maybe three or four times uh, every month just to go on like an op to, to cover. And on, on in that op, you were on standby sitting in a pulse, or you were logging into Bridge of Fleet. That was the most you used your Titan. And yes, it's great that more Titans being used when they're out there in space doing things and vulnerable, but it's also um, these players have such big dependencies on um, on like the safety net that they have now. Yeah, and if you remove uh, the safety net, I think it's gonna be great. What we gotta do moving forward here, though, we have a new uh, the greatest thing to come out of. Uh, this year's um, Vegas is the new Triglavian Dreadnought. Uh, here's another link of the image I linked it a second ago. Uh, stats on this thing, they're saying that they're suggesting 32,000 DPS out to 70 kilometers. We know Triglavians track everything under the sun, so it's going to freaking murder zone things. And uh, I, may be, also... I may be wrong with this, but when I was oh, watching it back, the footage, they only said they were... Uh, um... They were only going to add Bayron ammo for it initially? Yes, I think. one type of ammo to start and with, which is, yes. which is yeah, which is the long range ammo, and if you're doing yep. thirty-two thousand DPS for your longest range ammo, fully spooled up, then you know you could get a hundred thousand K with a cult or something. Oh, maybe. oh yeah, it's going to be absolutely be, insane. The main problem I have with it is how long is it going to take to get to thirty-two thousand DPS? How long? Because uh, if it's like four so minutes, full of time. Yeah. If it's four minutes and you're, you know, you're Only using these gang situations, for a few seconds, right? You know. I think the Here's main problem where, is going to be how okay. pricey is it going to be. Yeah. Like if well, they, you can they afford said this. it, then fine. They came out and said this. These will not be more expensive than the current faction dreads, which said about 20 bill. They're looking for a happy medium. They they want it to be worth two or three normal dreads, so five I to think, six I think bill about range. Seven, seven, to, seven to ten bill, I think, is, is, if it's, is useful because you're doing think, yeah. basically super carrier DPS, um, you know, with obviously not as much tank, so... Um, I'm gonna say that I'm gonna say it right now. Seven seven bill of is, is is good in my opinion. Yeah, if it's if it's anywhere from five to seven, these will be the single best home defense ships in the game 
period. I mean, maybe the heavy bombs would scare me out of using it, but if I know I've got a support fleet that could show up at any moment, I'm going to park this badass motherfucker on a gate and dare any fleet to get within 70 kilometers of me and just watch them die almost instantly to Draglavian tracking with a big-ass fucking gun. Like, holy shit, this thing is sexy. And it looks sexy. If you haven't seen the image or the video, I recommend doing so. Now, it, like, opens up like it's about to devour you. Uh, and it shoots a giant fuck-off laser beam that just is absolutely amazing. Uh, I will own one of these. The biggest question I have is training time. Uh, as we know, getting the dreads as they are now takes quite a while. And with Triglavian, everything is new. So how long is it going to take to get up to that level 5 or level 4 uh, to really be effective in these things? Uh, another question that a lot of people have is, okay, it's going to have some fuck-off DPS, but is it going to have a proper tank like the other dreads do? Some of the dreads can actually tank, you, you have, know, you have 30, eight, 40 guys. Well, yes, you are, because it has eight low slots, and it has oh an armor God. resistance bonus. So it's going to be... It's a revelation with another, yeah, with another low slot. Yeah, that's I like it. Yeah, this we is, can this... already hit 8, 9 milli HP on a revelation with, right. with a decent... I can't wait for this. I'm going to fly one. I know I'll fly one. I've flown all the Triglavian ships in the game so far. I love every single one, especially for solo PvP. This ship is going to be sex. The second best thing to come out of this, and I heard a lot of groaning on this, but I don't agree, and I hope you guys uh, take a moment to think about that, is the wallet change is coming. Uh, we actually have a really, really, really good-looking wallet coming to the game. Uh, here's some links to the images of what that will look like, and I'll be honest, I love this. I love this a lot. Looks really cool. Uh, looks more like a modern, I mean, what you would see in online banking. You have... Yeah, yeah I mean, they're updating the look and feel to catch up with, you know, yeah. life in 2019. AMA, I like AMA, Hilmar said that the wallet was one of the first things they did in the game in 2002, and they haven't touched it since. <laughs> you know, it's 17 years. But it, yep. this wallet looks looks amazing. Um, they also are going to be updating the the tunnel effects when, you, when yeah. you're um, taking the gates tunnel. going from... Uh, well, warp tunnels planned. So right now they're working on, and they have mostly done, uh, taking a gate, uh, entering a abyssal site, um, jumping to a sino, and jumping to a covert sino. Those four are pretty much almost done. I think uh, the yeah. CCP guy has said. I don't remember his name. Yeah, that, but that, um, the effects look really cool, and there's some really cool effects. A lot of people um, don't, don't like that, and it's interesting. Um, a lot of people don't like looking at the cool like. Uh, art department stuff, but that art one no, hour presentation. Used, no, the one hour presentation by the art department is fucking awesome. Like I really, no, I'm saying that the, the people yeah. that are whining about the new look of the yeah. wallet will just fucking get used to it. Like there, right, there, yeah. there's bigger fish to fry. If you're if you're super butt blasted about an update to the wallet which hasn't been changed since the game was released, get your fucking priorities straight. Yeah, and then uh, finally we got to move on to another next story. Like, there's a lot of the Vegas stuff where there's more Vegas stuff. But that's not stuff coming out for six months. I mean, Christmas time. So we've got months and months to talk about a lot of these things. But we got to move on to a big breaking story that happened within the last two weeks. Uh, Hi Wanto has decided, uh, along with Tau AD, to disband and end the, the Snuffed Out Alliance. Um, just to kind of give you an idea, Snuffed Out has announced this past week they're disbanding. It's mainly due to Tau AD and Hi Wanto wanted to focus on real life and kind of step away from the game. Uh, what does that mean for the snuffed out corps that are active? Elita Sops is going to join We Form Volta. Uh, Adversity is going back to Psychotic Tendencies, so Tissue might be coming back. Uh, Risk Breakers join Pen is Out. And Low Life, the main corporation, will remain in Losec uh, for anyone who wants to play casually and roam. So they're trying to find their new homes. Uh, Snuff's dead. Uh, by, by Snuff dying here, that's like the last major Losec group in the game gone. I think that's that's it. No sex dead. Um, yeah, I'm but never going to here it's... for anything that involved adversity as a corp in any way. So, you know. Yeah. Didn't he give you like an official statement or something? Oh, yeah. So he messaged me just a minute ago and gave me an official statement. His official statement is, I'm disbanding because Montani uh, attacked me at IRL at Vegas and said if I didn't disband, he'd kill Giannis. Uh, that's my official statement, and I'm at a Halloween party, so I can't talk right now. Uh, Who am I calling? <laughs> I have no idea. It was. I, I, I don't. That's know what he wanted to share. I, I don't know um, either. I mean, look, I, I, it's 
it's sad to see an active group go, but you know, that was bound to happen when you rely on two people and those two people leave. Right. Like you see this all the time with groups that, uh, rely on like one or two cults of personality. Those cults of personality grow up and leave the game. And then the alliance just kind of disbands because no one else has ever FC'd or took over or done anything, which is why I like goons. Cause we have such vast numbers. January Valentine says, imagine crying over penis smashes, trash personality. That's uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I've never been a fan of anything associated with uh, adversity, that corporation that had uh, Lex Arson in it, because he decided to make Benghazi jokes on Twitter a couple years ago, yeah, and that is a that really guy. fast way to earn my eternal enmity. But, yeah, uh, he made a lot of really childish jokes I didn't like and don't want to even think about. So Anyway, so yeah, fuck, fuck those guy. people or fuck adversity. Yep. Uh, sucks to see snuffed out, falling apart, uh, but shit happens, and they'll probably just reform in some other alliance in a slightly different configuration soon. Uh, you know, we've seen Black Legion type entities fall apart and reform, uh, right. and stuff is sort of a, a similar, like, low sec entity. So, th all right, so we are way over time. I want to thank yes. everybody for sticking with us. I want to thank uh, Jay and Pando for coming on as guests. And uh, yeah, so we will be doing uh, same bad time, same bad channel next week. Uh, we will be at, I think, an hour earlier for the Europeans. Uh, the yep. United States is finally getting with the program and having uh, daylight savings time starting tomorrow. So, uh, yeah, so we'll be an hour earlier next week than our normal time because we do everything based upon Wisconsin time in the Imperium. <laughs> so, all right, guys, thank you yeah. so much for coming. Thank you, yeah, Pando. Thank Pando. you, Jay. And we will see you all next week. Yep. Any other? Thanks. Yep. See you guys. Bye. You are about to receive messages that may be harmful to your mental state. Your sense of reality will be questioned. Your view on things will be altered. You are now part of the meta. The meta controls everything. The meta determines what will and will not happen. You are